Hovindism number two, the first law of thermodynamics. This textbook shows the kids, shows the teachers, that they should stress that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure the kids believe this. Actually, the recommendation said to, quote, introduce the concept of one million of something and then expand to one billion. Stress that the earth is thought to be 4.5 billion years old, thus it is necessary to divide up time into manageable units called eras. That is the goal of the lesson plan. Explain the concept of million and billion, then give basic instruction regarding geologic eras. I'm a little old-fashioned. <clears throat> I think in science class we ought to be teaching science. You know, things that we can observe and test and demonstrate. Things like the first law of thermodynamics, which tells us matter cannot be created or destroyed. It is now time for remedial thermodynamics. As one may quickly glean from the word itself, thermodynamics deals with the movement of heat, not matter. Succinctly, the first law of thermodynamics states that the increase in the internal energy of a system is equal to the amount of energy added by heating the system minus the amount lost as a result of work done by the system on its surroundings, and it's represented by this fancy little formula here. Well, since everything is made out of matter and it can't be created or destroyed, only changed, how did the world get here? We're here, you know. As we have detailed in previous videos, humans evolved, sharing our last common ancestor with chimpanzees. Planets form from accretion of matter found in a protostar's accretion dust. Once a planetesimal accumulates enough mass, its gravity will cause it to collapse to form a protoplanet. So that leaves only two choices. Somebody made the world. Why is it creationists can only ever think of two possible explanations? Also, what evidence leads to this position? Or the world made itself. There's no other choice. In reality, there are many possibilities. Also, we refer to it as gravity. Planets no more make themselves than an apple throws itself to the ground from a tree. Well, there's a few out there on the lunatic fringe who will tell you, we're not really here at all. We just think we're here. <laughs> and you thought our fishy friend had left us. Okay, you can forget about those folks. Uh, we're here. So either somebody made the world, like the Bible says, God created the heaven and the earth, or the world made itself, like the humanists believe. It's just self-existing and not created. A holy non-sequitur, Batman. What do humanists have to do with anything here? Well, if nobody created it, how did it get here? Could it be the expansion of space-time that led to the formation of light elements, which in turn would condense and collapse under gravity to form stars, that would form the heavy elements, which would be scattered by supernova, and would condense and collapse into a protostar's accretion disk under gravity to form planetesimals and eventually planets? No, no, that's, that's far too logical. The devil knew this was going to be hard to get folks to believe, so he thought and he thought and he thought, and one day he came up with the Big Bang Theory. The Hovind Classic, a combined ad hominem and a non sequitur. How many have ever heard of the Big Bang Theory before? I was on the airplane years ago flying from Dallas to San Francisco, the land of the fruits and the flakes. Such bigotry is simply vile. And I happen to sit right next to a professor from Berkeley University. So begins a very, very long red herring of dubious veracity. I don't know if you folks down here in San Diego have ever heard of Berkeley or not. But Berkeley is not a Bible college. Uh-oh, our fishy friends are multiplying. So here I was sitting on the airplane about that far away from this guy, and we started talking about creation and evolution. Everybody I sit by on the airplane wants to talk about that. So I talk about it with him. He said he believed in evolution. I said, yes, sir, I figured that. You have to to teach at Berkeley. It looks like our fishy friends may be taking over. Also, for the record, knowledge of biology is a requirement for those wishing to enter that field of study. Economics, English literature, and most other departments do not expect their faculty to be experts in biology. I said, tell me, sir, if you believe in evolution, how did the world get here? Um, remember, physics is not biology. He said it came from the Big Bang. I said, wow, I'd like to hear about this. He said, you're a science teacher and you've never heard of the Big Bang? I said, oh, yes, sir, I've heard a lot about the Big Bang. And I believe in the Big Bang, uh, but my Big Bang is a lot different than yours. While Mr. Hoven may believe his own nonsense, science is based on evidence, not belief. You tell me about your Big Bang, and then I'll tell you about my Big Bang. Are you ready for this journey down the rabbit hole? You may want to pause the video and find a very, very stiff drink before proceeding.
And so the professor started off on one of those answers. It looked like it came straight from the textbook. So much so that it appears that the economics, or was it political science, professor directly quotes numerous middle school science textbooks. And yeah, we, we say he quotes because Mr. Hoven will actually say in a moment, he said... He said, well, Mr. Hoven, I believe about 20, 18 to 20 billion years ago... Oh, that's a long time, folks. Our fishy friend wishes to know what's Mr. Hoven's point. All the matter in the universe... That's a lot of stuff. Again, our fishy friend asks, what's your point? Hey, did you know the word universe comes from two Latin words? Uni, which means single, and verse means a spoken sentence. We live in a universe, a single spoken sentence. You see, God said, let there be. Now that'll preach, man. There's a sermon in there somewhere, all right? And that sermon probably has something to do with thou shall not lie. The word universe is derived from the old French word univers, which was derived from the Latin word universum. Universum is derived from poetic contraction of uno versum. Universum is derived from the poetic contraction uno versum, which was first used by Lucretius in Book 4 of De Rerum Natural. Un versum connects un from unus, meaning one, and versum from vertere, meaning something rotated, rolled, or changed. This leads to two interpretations, everything combined into one, i.e. the cosmos, or everything rotated as one, which can be considered a translation of the Greek version of the universe. <clears throat> All the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. What? All the matter in the universe was squished into a dot smaller than a period on a page. Wow. That's one crowded dot. And heavy, too. Who held, who held that thing up, anyway? Weight is the force of gravity acting on the mass of an object. Since the Big Bang Theory describes the expansion of space-time, and no object can exist outside of space-time, the weight of the singularity is inconsequential. For the same reason, the medium in which space-time is suspended is also irrelevant to the Big Bang Theory. And it must be noted that that style of logic is how five-year-olds attempt to justify people living south of the equator falling off the Earth. Hey, boys and girls, it ain't the last time it happened, nor the first. This textbook says someday all of the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area, no bigger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then, another Big Bang will occur. It happens every 80 to 100 billion years. Sadly, it is common for people to ridicule that which they do not understand, especially in America. According to Einstein's theory of general relativity, space-time is either expanding or contracting. Try as Einstein might, there is no constant state universe solution. So you can forget about global warming. <laughs> We're going to get squished. <laughs> global squishing. Call your senator. Pass a law. Quick, you know. Prevent global squishing. Um. Why is it that religious groups are so opposed to the reality that the temperatures on Earth are increasing? Now, this textbook author was brilliant. I could not believe how smart this guy was. Wait, wasn't this supposed to be about an encounter with a UC Berkeley professor? And why the ad hominem attack on a children's textbook author? He said, boys and girls, nothing really means nothing. You have to be at least that smart to write a book. He said not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. What? Yes, boys and girls, you see nothing exploded, and here we are. So what does this excerpt actually say? Quote, the Big Bang Theory does not explain how the universe began. The theory only explains how the existing universe could have developed. <laughs> Who could ask for anything more, you know? <laughs> See, the Big Bang idea started with a guy named Latimer. Wait, wait, wait. The devil knew this was going to be hard to get folks to believe, so he thought and he thought and he thought, and one day he came up with the Big Bang Theory. I suppose asking for internal consistency is a little much. 
Who could ask for anything more, you know? <laughs> See, the Big Bang idea started with a guy named Latimer. He said the thing that exploded was two, uh, a few light years in diameter. Well, at the minimum, that would be two, so that's about 12 trillion miles in diameter. Later, they said, oh, no, it wasn't near that big. By 1965, they said it was only 275 million miles in diameter. Then they shrank it and said it's only 71 million miles. They shrank it again to 54,000 miles. Then in 1983, they really shrank it. They said it was a trillionth the diameter of a proton. And now they're saying nothing at all exploded. Yes, unlike religious dogma, science incorporates acquired knowledge. Just think, we could have kept the Bronze Age understanding of the world. That would be fun and enjoyable for everyone. Wow. Just not sure what to say about that. Yes, I suppose not, aside from the fact that a singularity is not nothing. They even put this in major science journals. This fellow said, uh, the observable universe could have evolved, i got to watch that word, from an infinitesimal region. In the Greek, that's a uh, dot. He said, it's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. Scientific American is a popular science magazine written for the lay public. In other words, it's not a major scientific journal and contains many of the common inconsistencies of science found in other non-peer-reviewed sources. Really, Mr. Hoven just doesn't know what a good source is. Yes, boys and girls, we all came from a dot, and the dot came from nothing. They call that science and put it in a science book? No, that is called an abysmal straw man argument that Mr. Hoven created. As noted in the middle school textbook, the Big Bang Theory only describes the current expansion of space-time in which our universe lies. Not the origin of anything. I think I'd call that a fairy tale and put it in the garbage. It's better to call it what it is, a silly straw man of your own creation. I said, Professor, uh, what happened to your dot? He said, well, all the dirt in the universe was drawn into this little tiny dot, and it was spinning. It spun real fast. That's what the textbooks teach. It spun faster and faster. And finally, one day, it exploded. Big bang. Wow, Mr. Owen's dishonesty has just reached a new level. Does this English lit professor review these middle school textbooks? Does he carry them around with him, dozens of them at a time, just in case? But I suppose we should actually look at what these excerpts say. It appears to be describing the gravitational collapse of hydrogen and helium to form a nebula as part of the formation of a star. Mr. Hoven even went so far as to annotate this with, quote, the nebula begins to rotate in a big red arrow. This isn't even about the Big Bang Theory. As if to even further drive home the point of his dishonesty, Mr. Hoven zooms in and shows this slide, where he's highlighted the text saying, quote, a star, our sun, was born. This passage has absolutely nothing to do with the Big Bang Theory. This, this is just ludicrous now. And pieces flew off and they became the galaxies, you know, sun, moon, stars, and finally people. Here we are. That was just another abysmal straw man argument. Following the initial expansion of space-time, the universe was composed of elementary particles. It would not be until many other natural processes acted that the first galaxies and stars would form.